function is just a way of putting them in. What he says is the textual metafunction organizes our interpersonal and experiential meanings into a linear and coherent whole by relating the other metafunctions to the users and the context. So what it's doing is what we're really trying to convey is the interpersonal meaning and the ideational meaning or the, you know, the experiential meaning. This is really too loud. Wait. I, I, I'm, um, so when we, that's a little better. Um, so when we uh, want to express this, we have to do it in this linear fashion. And so there's two aspects to the theme ream structure. One is that we are forcing this, all this meaning, instead of the meaning just kind of flowing all over the place, um, we're forcing it into a particular linear order. But at the same time, uh, it's tying the, uh, what we're saying to the particular context we're in. As you remember from the very first lecture, this theory is very particular about tying what's happening in the speech act, you know, the speaking, to the context of situation and the context of culture. And so uh, what one of the things that the textual metafunction does is uh, relate the, what you are saying in, in this particular clause or in this particular section of your discourse to everything else that's going on in the situation and in within the discourse as, much, as well. So this is the idea between the thematic progression because what it's doing is it's linking it with what came before and what comes after. So it, it gives a smooth progression in terms of the uh, development of ideas as you're speaking. Now it doesn't mean, some people also ask, do you have to follow this very strict, you know, theme, ream, ream, theme, ream, theme, ream, theme. No, it, there's no rules. Language doesn't really have any rules. I mean, we have conventions and we have choices and it's really all about choices. And that's what this grammar is all about. It's, there's nothing in here, like if, when you read the text and when we talk, I'm never gonna say anything is ungrammatical. All I'm gonna say is that's not the way we normally do it. Um, we can change anytime we want. We, when I was young, we didn't say certain things that we say now. They were ungrammatical then, they're so-called grammatical now. That's a lot of nonsense to say grammatical or ungrammatical. These are just conventions. It's just like the clothing. When I was young, girls didn't wear these kind of shorts to class. Now they do. Uh, <laughs> so it was ungrammatical then, it's grammatical now. You know, it's, it's just uh, conventions of society. So as the culture the, the situation of culture changes, I mean, the context of culture changes, that's going to influence the representation of that culture in the context of situation and then in the particular expressions that you do. So all of these things are the same. That's why, you know, one student, as I mentioned, said what I teach is a theory of everything because it's all related. It's all part of behavior. It's all part of life. You know, so everything here is all just think about what real life is like. It's, this is not some abstract thing where we're talking about it in space or something. We're talking about what happens between people in real life and how people act in real life. And so it's, there's no hard and fast rules in anything, right? I mean, the government likes to set rules for things and those are hard and fast. But even those, you break them, but then you just suffer the consequences. Well, it's the same thing with conventions in society, you know, if I wanted to wear a skirt to class, I could, but you know, I would have to suffer the consequences of people laughing at me for wearing a skirt to class. Uh, but it's the same exact thing as if I speak uh, in a so-called ungrammatical way, or I speak in a, in a less clear way. So if I don't follow the normal kind of theme ream pattern, then people are not gonna understand me as well. So that's my choice. Um, so, you know, there are some writers that are famous for being really bad. In fact, like Noam Chomsky, a very famous, uh, linguist, I hate to use the word for him, but uh, this guy who writes a lot about language, um, he, his writing style is so bad that there was actually a, a, um, a bot, a, um, a program online years ago called Chomsky Fog, where you could take normal um, clear text, put it into this, uh, this bot, and then it would come out in Chomsky style garbled language. Um, seriously, I mean, that's how bad his writing was. And he did that on purpose. I mean, some people do choose to be, they think it sounds more erudite to be, you know, uh, obscure and difficult to understand. And readers also, like if, you're, like, if you write really clearly and people understand it, then they think you're not saying anything important. 
this is a weird thing about people. If they think it's too easy, then, then it can't be good. Uh, and so a lot of, a lot of I'm, I'm, this, is not, this is a real thing. A lot of academics will purposely write in a very strange way just to make themselves sound more, you know, uh, like they're writing something very important. A, there was a whole school called postmodernism that was really good at this. They were really very vacuous. They weren't saying anything important, but they made it sound like it was important. I'm serious. <laughs> Um, I hope there's no postmodernists in the audience, but, uh, but this is basically what it was. They just would throw, throw a bunch of big sounding words together and, and hope that people didn't see that they actually weren't saying anything important. Um, so it's just choices we make, but you, when you make a choice, whether it's in real life, you know, whether your dress style or your, your way you speak, you, can, you have choices, they're all free, you know, but the, the point is there's always going to be consequences for those choices. So, you know, your meaning, you may not get the, the meaning across that you want to get across because you make a particular choice. And this is what I talked about earlier, you know, how we can evaluate because you can see, okay, what is the speaker trying to get across or what are you trying to get across? So if you use this particular construction, it may not get across. It, you know, so then maybe you want to use the other choice. So like one, one person wrote, oh, if you write like, like in the three examples of theme ream structure that I gave in talking about the unmarked theme with imperatives, the third one he was saying is very boring, you know, because it's like the unmarked theme and this is this and the unmarked theme and this is this and the unmarked theme and this is this. Boring is clear though, you know. Uh, in creative writing, maybe you don't want to be so clear, you know, unless you're Hemingway. Uh, then you write in very, you know, uh, cut and dried short sentences that are very clear, but that's a style, you know, so it's all about your style. And if you want to be clear or you want to be flowery or you want to be uh, obscure, whatever, that's your choice, but there's always going to be a consequence to that. So it's up to you to make your choices. And that's what this whole grammar is about, understanding those choices. So you understand that, okay, I'm going to choose this and then I'm going to get that. When I choose this, I'm going to get that. And so it's just about understanding those choices. There's no hard and fast rules for anything. Um, and so someone also asked this, is there, are there any cases in which theme ream structure is not followed? Now theme, theme ream, um, again, this, when we're talking about English, theme ream and topic comment kind of get mixed together. That's not the case in all languages. In some languages, topic comes at the end of the clause, not at the beginning. But in English, the topic comes at the beginning of the clause, and so that's what we're talking about. So we're defining the topical theme as the first participant process or circumstance, which we'll talk more about here, um, that you come. And everything else after that is ream. And so um, that topic, though, there's two aspects to this. One is uh, the, you, you can't avoid that. You can't avoid the theme being the first part, because the theme is not something linguistic. The theme is... Um, something about our cognition. The theme is the starting point. So whenever you're understanding anything, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's language or whether it's watching somebody or whether it's whatever, the first thing that you experience is going to influence how you understand what comes after that. And so that's what theme is all about. So it's, it's your starting point and it's the starting point of the interpretation and so it influences the rest of the interpretation. So you can't put the theme after the ream because it's not a, a linguistic thing. This is something you don't really have a choice with. What you have a choice with is what goes into the theme. So some languages choose to put the topic in the theme all the time. That's pretty common. Some languages choose not to. They put something else in there. So, um, and what's obligatorily in the theme, what's obligatorily, uh, what's not obligatory in the, in the theme, that's going to be a choice that languages make. And then as an individual, you have a choice with some of these interpersonal themes. So one person also asked, when I say, um, like yesterday, John, I went to the store, why is John there? You know, it's, if I say, John, yesterday I went to the store, then John is an interpersonal theme, it's evocative. But if I say, yesterday, John, I went to the store, John uh, is part of the ream. And they said, why isn't it evocative? Well, evocative is a different, is a, is a function, and it still has the function of evocative, but the speaker chose in that case not to put it into the theme. It follows the theme because yesterday is the theme there. And then, so if you say, John, yesterday I went to the store, then John is an interpersonal theme because it comes before the theme, the topical theme. But if I say, yesterday, John, I went to the store, then John is a, still evocative. It's still doing the same thing. 
but it's just not part of the, in the theme there. So we don't consider it part of the interpersonal theme. It's just because it's after the topical theme. So that's just a definitional thing within this theory that everything after the topical theme is part of the ring. It still has the same function though. So like with not, another person asked about, you know, when do we know that, that not is part of the finite and when is it not part of the finite? So with, with this, again, it's, it's, it's the meaning. So we're always going to be falling back on what is the meaning, what is the function? Function and meaning is the same thing, really. So what is the meaning? So you look at what is it doing? And so it's still, like say, a negation will still have the same function, whether it's in the finite or in the predicator or, you know, in the ream uh, uh, or the residue. But it's, uh, it's doing something a little different, but, it, but it's still negating. Uh, Okay, with um, another question related to this topic comment and theme ream is whether theme has to be something already known or kind of old. And that's not the case, at least in English. In some languages, yes, that will be the case that the topic is always something that's already kind of known or understood, so-called given information. In English, because we're using word order for marking mood and grammatical relations, then very often, the, uh, the topic or the, the to topical theme will actually be new information, but then it will have prosodic stress. So if you ask me, you know, who won the game yesterday? And I say, Singapore won the game yesterday. Then, uh, then I have to put stress if, because the Singapore there is the topic, but it's new information, I have to put a special stress on it. Whereas if you ask me, you know, what did Singapore do yesterday? I say Singapore won the game yesterday, where the stress comes at the end of the clause. That would be the, the unmarked or usual situation. So when the, when the topic is new information, then you have to put a special stress on it uh, to mark it as new information. So it's not the case that uh, it has to be known. And this is why in cases like that, especially in writing where you can't add the prosodic stress, in order to make, the, make it clear, that's when we use the predicated theme. When you say something like, it was Singapore who won the game, right? So that's why we use that construction. People were asking me, why do we, use, why do we have these extra constructions like predicated theme and, uh, and equ the thematic equative? It's because you wanna make clear these relationships of you know, what's new, what's old, and also the, you know, what's theme and what's not. Um, another qu good question was, must theme and ream strictly be text? Uh, no, not at all. You ask Amanda about her FYP project where she did intertextuality in Tumblr, where she showed how there's this mixture of text and images all together to form a particular post. And you read the whole post, you know, all these different people contributing to a single post, and it's quite interesting what happens. And so people may you know, respond to an image with just the, the, the ream, assuming the, the, the image is the theme. And so all of this thing can happen. And that's why now a lot of people, you know, are doing multimodal analysis of, you know, looking at videos of people and also looking at artwork. This theory has been applied to much more than language. This theory looks, they've applied the concepts of this theory to architecture, to artwork, to all kinds of things. So it's, it's not limited. It's a, um, it's a theory of meaning creation. He calls it semiotics. Semiotics is strictly the, the, um, the meaning of uh, the, the uh, a study of signs or symbols, but really it's about meaning creation. So when we look at something, how do we create meaning out of that? And so whether it's artwork, whether it's an arch architecture, or whether it's in, because when you look at a building, you can create meaning. And, some buildings, like if you go to Mao's mausoleum in Beijing, it's, it's full of meaning, right? The way it's built and everything. I actually heard a talk where somebody gave this, you know, an hour long talk on the meaning of all the different bits of the Mao mausoleum. Um, so there, there's all kinds of aspects of meaning in our daily life. It's not just language. And so this theory is applicable to all kinds of meaning creation. And so it has been applied to artwork uh, and a number of other aspects. Um, Okay, any other comments, questions before we get started on today's lecture? Nothing, everything is crystal clear as usual. Okay, um, 
Okay, so today we're going to start talking about the actual content of what we're saying. So-called content, meaning you know what it, the who, the real world, who did what to whom, uh, that we're trying to get across. So we we already talked about the interpersonal, you know, what's happening between the speaker and hearer, but then you know part of that interaction is we're trying to get across some information, and so today we're talking about what that information is, and aside from the interpersonal information. So in this case, we, we experience something. When we experience, we have, actually, it's just a big mass, right? We don't actually experience individual bits. When we see, when we hear, it's just all indif, no, what's the word I'm going for? Undifferentiated, undifferentiated. Yeah, somehow I had an in coming in there. Undifferentiated mass, right? But our brain, breaks it up into little bits and organizes it in particular ways that make sense to us, right? So that's why babies, when they come out, they're just like, oh, no, no, no. They, don't know, they don't know what's going on because it's all just a mass to them. And little by little, they start to be able to focus and, and pick out things that they want to pay more attention to. And then they start to associate uh, actions or uh, uh, things with that, with you know, people they see or whatever. But initially, it's all just one undifferentiated mass. And the sounds, it's the same thing. But actually, the baby, even in the stomach of the mother, is still is starting to differentiate the sounds of the mother's language and uh, some of the other things. Because um, even a baby, when it's first born, is already kind of attuned to the, to the sounds of the language. Because a baby can hear all kinds of sounds. But it's just over time, we become habituated. You know, we've developed a habit of hearing or paying more attention to the sounds of our native language than we do to other sounds. We become attuned to that. And so this is, a, a, this is the way language is acquired is just through this kind of habituation. You know, you get the habit, you develop the habit of paying attention to the things that are related to your language and you kind of ignore other things. So if you're, uh, you know, and you create these categories, uh, I shouldn't get into this lecture, but you create categories and the categories could be sound categories. Like if you're an American English speaker, you hear ba, you hear pa, and you think of those as one sound, but you hear pa as another sound. Whereas if you're a Tagalog speaker, then you hear ba and, uh, as one sound and pa and pa as one sound. So you cut up the world differently uh, depending on what your language is. Now this is not just with sound, this is with everything. So every language cuts up the world differently. But even with that, you know, that's our that's the code that, that the holiday talks about. In other words, our semantic framework that our culture gives us. So this is the culture, this is the context of culture. It's this categorization that we inherit from our culture, you know, that we learn uh, as babies as part of our culture. So we call, we, we create certain categories and then give them names. But even once we have that, we have a lot of choices in terms of when we have an individual experience, how we represent it. So if I throw a rock through a window, right? Uh, say I'm playing baseball, and then I, you know, by mistake I throw a rock and it goes through the window of somebody's house, then I could say, oh, the rock went through the window, right? Where I completely avoid any uh, mention of who did it, right? Uh, so I might do that for a reason, uh, that I don't want anybody to know who, who, who threw it. Or I said, you know, the window smashed. Or I could say, I threw the rock through the window, taking full responsibility for it, right? Um, or I could say, um, uh, you know, I threw the ball, and then I didn't, you know, don't say what happened to it. So there's a lots of different ways that we can profile the same event, uh, the same situation, and it's again depend depending on the personal situation you're in, your personal goals. Um, what you think is important to express, what you don't think is important to express. Um, actually, this is one another question I forgot to talk about uh, from the question. Somebody asked, in terms of deciding the mood structure, they're going to have to take into account social status and things like that. And that's very much a part of these decisions of how to profile something, which mood to use. You know, so if I'm if I'm a, a full professor and I'm talking to my assistant, I might be more likely to use an imperative form like, you know, 
input this for me or you know scan this for me whereas if she's talking to me she might be more likely to use an interrogative in asking me to do something right just because of our status difference um, unless she's really you know uppity but uh, so these are choices that are determined by the context of situation and they're very much a part of it when, once you if you when you go on you'll learn more about sociolinguistics where there are a lot of these factors these social factors your age your social status your um, particular work status all these kind of different things that come into making these choices so uh, how you represent a state of affairs what mood you're going to use how you're going to lay out your theming structure all of these are going to be affected by this context of situation and the context of culture so the context of culture informs the context of situation and the context of situation then is manifested or is represented in the particular forms that you use and there's actually a whole field of uh, discourse studies where they show how the, the discourse, the way you talk, actually is used to reinforce the social relationships that you have, right? So it's not arbitrary at all. It's all very much determined by the context of culture and the context of situation. And so when you, um, so by being polite to somebody in authority, you're actually reinforcing that relationship with that person. Right. Whereas if you are rude to somebody in a thing, then you're challenging that relationship. So language is very powerful in this regard. It actually defines in some ways or supports our social relationships and our reality to some extent. There's actually a book called The Social Construction of Reality. And then there's a book called The Linguistic Construction of Reality. Um, so there's, you know, these things are, are very real. And uh, in order to really understand why forms, particular forms are used, you have to take all of this into consideration. So here I've just given a few examples, like the shop closes at six versus the shop's closing time is at six, right? So this is our, these are two different ways, two different ways of representing what might be considered the same effect. Or you could say the sun is setting, the sun is on the horizon. So, you know, I'm standing on a beach and I'm looking at the sun so one way is to say, oh, the sun is uh, setting, or the sun is on the horizon, or the sun is blinding me, right? So you, you, it could be exactly the same experience you're having, but you choose to profile or semanticize or talk about, verbalize, however you want to say that, a particular way of talking about it, a particular aspect of it. And by doing that, you're also downplaying other aspects of it. Um, now, when we, when we do this semanticization or verbalization or profiling, whatever, we generally break it down into different uh, aspects. Uh, participants, the people who are involved in it or the things that are involved in it. Uh, so, I, like, I just pulled this wire, right? So, uh, the wire is a participant. I'm a, I'm a participant. You know, I pulled the wire. So, I've got me as a participant. I've got the wire as a participant. And then I've got the process of me pulling it. So, um, so there's the participants, you've got the process, and then it's um, everything that we talk about is happens in a particular situation or a particular time, place, uh, or manner of way of doing it, or other aspects. We're going to be talking more about all these circumstantial meanings. So the circumstances of the events that you're talking about. So I went to the, to the library yesterday, right? So yesterday is when I went or I took out a book in the library, right? So in the library is where I took out the book. Or um, I, I read the book carefully, you know, carefully is how I read the book. So all of these are circumstantial aspects of that. So it's not the participant and it's not the core part of the process, but extra circumstances within which these, uh, these happen. And, we can see this, can I write here? It's kind of like a uh, concentric circle. Can I do this? So if you have concentric circles, so this kind of the process is the kind of the core happening. Then you have your participants And then you have the circumstances. Well, 
within which this, these two interact. Um, so the, uh, <coughs> am I getting ahead of myself? Uh, yeah, so here I said it, uh, you can think of it in terms of concentric circles. Um, now, because we do this so commonly, you know, this, this is common across languages. It's not absolutely necessary. There are some languages that, uh, well, all languages basically will talk about these three things, but they, the way that they grammaticalize it, or we use the word grammaticalization, but again, it's a kind of conventionalization or habit forming on a personal level, but you might say convention is like a habit of the society. So grammaticalization just means you know, your conventionalized way of doing something grammatically. So languages very often will grammaticalize a, a, a word class for talking about processes, which we will often call verb. So verbs are just the grammaticalization of our way of talking about, the conventionalization of our way of talking about processes. Participants often get conventionalized as a word class called noun. So when we talk about people, places, and things, then we, in many languages, will conventionalize a form class or a word class called noun. That's not the case of all languages. There are some languages like Tagalog that doesn't have a class of noun and verb. So you can use any word any way you want. It's really a cool language. So um, really, you can use anything as a, like there's even, you know the new president of the Philippines is really crazy? <laughs> and he's just killing people all the time. And so now, when mothers want to, to frighten their little kids, they don't call them a boogeyman or anything like that. His name is Duterte. So you use his name as a verb, and you just say, Baka ma Duterte, uh, you will be duterte uh, You know, in other words, Duterte will come and kill you if you don't listen to me or something like that. So everyone is, you know, so afraid of Duterte uh, that he's actually become a verb. And this happens all the time, so if you have like, there was a typhoon on Doi. Uh, so when um, uh, there was a time I was looking at houses in the Philippines, and um, then we, the first question you would ask, this was short, shortly after the on Doi um, uh, typhoon, which flooded huge areas of the, of the city of Manila. And I mean, flooded like, you know, the water was up to like that high. And so the first question you'd ask is, not on Doi, you know, did, um, uh, did it, was it ondoid? In other words, was it affected by ondoy? Uh, and so you just take whatever it is you want and you make it your predicate. Now in English, we do a little bit of that and you can do that, uh, but it's, it's not as free as, uh, as in Tagalog. So it, generally languages will have a form class that develops out of the frequency of using a particular way of talking about participants and a particular way of process. Now circumstances, are not the kind of direct participants. So they often will have either a special adverbial form, like when we say carefully, you know, we put the lee on it. And historically, that just comes from the word like, you know, to do it like this. Um, so, you know, it's like we say, you know, careful like, but careful like over time just became carefully. Um, and, uh, or they, you have these prepositional phrases, and we'll talk more about what prepositional phrases are, but what they, basically what they do is they allow for other participants to be brought into the clause. They, not, the, not the core participants, but extra participants to be brought in using these prepositions. Um, so let's look at some examples of these participants and uh, circumstances and processes. So here we have um, the water evaporated, well you could say the water evaporated from the cup, uh, where that we could add a circumstantial. Now part of the, the idea of the circumstantial is that it's optional. That's why it's not one of these core participants. It's extra, so I could say the water evaporated or I could say the water evaporated from the cup or I could say the water evaporated quickly from the cup, but you can't leave out either the water or evaporated. Those are kind of required to have a complete clause. But you can leave out the circumstances if you want. The water damaged the carpet. Now in this case, you have two required um, 
participants. So the first one only required one participant. We call that an intransitive clause. Um, the word transitive, which is the second one we call transitive. What transitive mean? It's a Latin word, you know, like trans, when we say like transoceanic or trans, something means, trans means across, right? So uh, transitive, itive means to carry, right? Uh, so tra to means the, the action is carried across from, from this participant to that participant. At least that's the way they conceived of it in Latin. So we still use the term transitive, meaning to carry across, the action carries across from this actor to this undergoer or you know, uh, goal. Uh, whereas in this case, there's no carrying across. So it's intransitive, in just means negative. It just means not, not transitive, intransitive is the same thing. It's just Latin in un, uh, kind of uh, negative. So it just means it doesn't carry across. So it's only one participant necessary. This one it requires two. You can't just say the water damaged. You have to say what was damaged. Uh, unless you have a, you make it into a passive, then you could say the carpet was damaged. And that the reason why we use a passive sometimes is because we don't want to mention who or what damaged it, right? Or like if I say, you know, the, the ball uh, was thrown through the window, you know, I don't want to say who threw the ball through the window. So I can say, well, the ball was thrown through the window. Uh, you know, I don't know anything about it. Um, uh, so, you know, sometimes we use passive as a way of getting rid of the actor. Um, or the water seeped into the room. In this case, there's, uh, you know, uh, usually you would have a place where if it's something like this seeping or, or going, you would have a place where you would go or he left. In this case, in a hurry is uh, just saying how he left, not where he went to. So um, uh, in, in many cases, we'll use the same form for different functions. So again, you have to always re reflect on the meaning of the forms, not just the form itself. But what is the form doing in that context? Uh, it's just like with these things, even though these things often um, grammaticalize into particular form classes, as we saw with the mushrooms example, right? We saw that uh, lung cancer in women mushrooms, depending on how you analyze it, mushrooms can be a process or it can be a participant, right? So you say lung cancer in women mushrooms, where mushrooms is the, the thing, mushrooms, then it's a participant. If you say lung cancer in women mushrooms, as when this becomes a process, meaning to grow quickly. So then it's very different. So the same words can be used in different ways. So it's always you have to look at the meaning. How is it being used? Um, and we can always make up new uses. This is the thing is language is not a fixed thing at all. It's human behavior. And just like we're always changing how we dress, we're always changing how we do other stuff. We're also changing how we speak. And so you can always use words in ways they've never been used before. As long as the other person can understand it, that's fine. And then if they like it, they'll use it and then they'll catch on and then you've started a whole trend and changed the world forever. So seriously, you can change the world. That's how you can change the world. Um, okay, I gave him some books in the library. Now here we have three participants. So this is what we call a bi-transitive or ditransitive, depending on whether you like Greek or Latin. So in Latin, you use bi means to, or in Greek, di means to, I don't know why they didn't talk to each other, but. So some, uh, since transitive is, is Latin, then I like to use bi-transitive. So it, what it means is it carries across to two different things, right? So instead of just carrying across to one, it carries across to two. So I bought him some books, or I gave him some books, and then in the library is just where that happened. So the circumstance of where that happened. So, uh, so we have transitive, uh, I mean, intransitive, transitive, and ditransitive, or bi-transitive. Um, and then we have, in the case of uh, imperatives, where we don't have any kind of subject or finite, and you may not need any other uh, participant at all. So here we have a case where there's no participant, where you just say stop. Now in this case, of course, there's an understood participant, meaning you stop. Uh, normally, you know, it could mean you plural or you singular, but anyway, it's, uh, it does mean you to some extent. It's kind of understood. But at least in the clause, you have no participants and in this case, uh, no circumstances either. Okay, so now we talked about 
here we have these processes of evaporated, damaged, seeped, left, gave, stopped. These are all processes. Now, there are six types of processes altogether, three main types and three kind of marginal types. Um, so it's important to distinguish them. All theories of grammar, all theories of language distinguish types of processes, or sometimes they'll call it, call it verbs, verbal semantics, or verb types, or action sort. There's a lot of names for this. But basically, what it means is that depending on the type of process, the kind of event you're talking about, you're going to have different kinds of participants, and it's going to be different nature of the process. And so the different nature of the process is going to affect how you represent it. And I'll, I'll be more clear about that in a second. So the first one, which is the main uh, kind of easiest one to deal with, is the material processes. So um, these are processes that describe what is happening or being done in the external world. So if I'm eating something, if I'm cr uh, I crash the book, uh, I crash my car, or I fall on the ground, or I shoot somebody, or I hit somebody, I drive to the store, I walk to the store, I shop all day, um, I feel something with my hand, like if I feel the board with my hand, that's, I have to clarify that because feel can be used for several different types of meanings. Um, so with these kind of things, if I you know, throw this to the ground, anything that involves the external world like that, where there's an action, there's a doing, then you can ask the question, if you can ask the question, the so-called probe just means you, you want to test to see if it's a material process, you can say, what did you do to it? So I can say, what did I do to this thing? I threw it to the ground, right? So then you know, I did something to it. So that's clearly a material process, right? Material meaning there's something in the world that's been affected. Or you could say, what happened to it? If it's intransitive, you could say, well, you know, what happened to the carpet? The, car the water seeped into the carpet. So what happened to the carpet? You can talk about what happened to something, uh, especially with intransitive or um, if you're focusing on the thing that was affected. Um, so if I say the carpet was damaged, then you know what happened to the carpet? The carpet was damaged. Now, these can be of either type where the thing exists ahead of time. So if I throw this on the ground, this thing is already existing before I throw it. But I can also be the, of the type where you create the object. Uh, like if I say, uh, I built her a house, or I built a house, just say I built a house, uh, or I, I dug a canoe out from a tree, I, um, you know, I built a fire. So these are things that didn't exist before I did the action, but they come into existence from the action. Uh, so those are two different types of material process. Um, and then with one of the things that's, um, when I talked about the manifestations or how, how these things are represented, with this kind of action, the unmarked or most usual tense is the, what's called present in present or present progress, progressive tense. So you say he is, he is building a house or he is eating his lunch or he is walking to the store. So you use the ing form of the verb most commonly. Now this is not the same for the other two that we're going to talk about, uh, the other two main types. So it's mainly with these, because these are dynamic verbs. These are things, there's something going on, right? There's a happening, there's a doing. So these are what, in some theories, they'll talk about these as dynamic verbs or activity verbs. There's something going on. And so that's why it's very often the, the progressive or, uh, you know, the is eating or is uh, sleeping or is um, a, uh, chomping on a bone, whatever. Uh, I'm running out of examples. Uh, the, uh, there's a something going on. And um, <clears throat> the thing about this is it, it narrows it down. If I say he eats, he eats peanut butter, right? That's very broad, right? That's the, that's the, the unmarked, uh, that's the present, the, the simple present uh, tense in English. If I say he eats peanut butter. Now, normally with an activity verb like that, and I mean a, uh, a mental a material process like uh, eat peanut butter, if you say he eats peanut butter, it's understood not as he's eating peanut butter right now, but he, it's like a habit that he has that he will 
eat peanut butter. Like I eat peanut butter for breakfast every morning. So I eat peanut butter. So I use the, the simple present. I eat peanut butter for breakfast. Now, if I'm eating it right now, I wouldn't do that. I, if I'm narrowing down the scope of the time to right now, the time of speaking, then I would say I am eating peanut butter, right? So this is what the present and present or the present progressive does. It narrows the time down to the time of speaking. Okay, rather being habitual. Um, clauses with material processes almost always include an actor. So we're going to be talking about the different types of participants that go with the different types of process. With a material process, it's, there's almost always going to be an actor. You know, the one who's doing, since there's a doing going on, is almost always going to be an actor if there's some kind of doing. If it's the happening, like the, you know, the, uh, the carpet was damaged, then it's going to be not going. There's not going to be an actor there, and in the carpet was damaged. There's no actor. In fact, you know, we've used a passive to get rid of the actor, but um, but that's the more marked pattern. So in the unmarked pattern, you're going to have the actor, uh, whether it's pre uh, transitive or intransitive. Um, and if it's transitive, then there's going to be a goal. There's going to be a, another participant that we call a goal. It's the thing affected. It's the goal. So you know, as we said, the the idea of transitive is the action goes from one to the other. So that's why the other one is called the goal, because that's the, the goal of the action. So if I'm uh, building a boat, so the, the goal of my action is to make that boat appear, right? So that's the, the goal. And so that's why we call that, that participant the goal. So if we look at the same examples and we put these names in there, we see that the water evaporated, we have the, the goal, uh, the water in this case evaporated or the water damaged the carpet. In this case, we have a goal and the actor, the water seeped into the room. We have the actor, actor, the man made a boat out of the tree, the carpenter built the house, the computer is running the program. All of these are an actor and these are all the goal. In the passive, so these are all active clauses. These are not passive. In the passive, we have the carpet was damaged by the water, the books were left on the table, the car was damaged by John, the boat was made by that man, the house was built by the carpenter in one month. So we have these choices with the material process, the, actor, uh, the active and passive. Again, it's a choice you make, and the choice is going to affect what appears in the theme and what appears as subject, right? So most of the time, when you use this passive, you're doing it because you want to make the goal, the, the, the subject, and if it's a declarative clause, then the subject is going to most often be the theme as well. So this is what uh, passive is all about, allowing you to make this the subject. Uh, whereas in the normal case, is for the actor to be the subject. Uh, that's at least in English, not in all languages, but at least in English, that's the normal case. Okay. All right. Um, Let's take our break a little bit early, then I'll come back and do mental processes. Uh, unless you have any questions first about material processes or anything else we talked about. I'm Two different um, 
tutorial handouts. Make sure you get them both.
question came up how do we tell you know when you have uh, with these participants there are some participants come in like the cup when you say evaporated from the cup um, the cup is is what we call an indirect participant that isn't required in the the clause so the water evaporated that's full that's complete by itself we can go home you can say the water evaporated and then we all go home and everybody's happy um, <laughs> Whereas, uh, and you can add extra things to that uh, if you want. And so these are these extra things that are brought in are the circumstances. Now, within the circumstances, almost generally, if it's not an adverbial form, it's in a preposition phrase. And I'm gonna talk more about this later, but just very briefly, the, the prepositions are what's called minor processes. So we have the major processes, which are the, the main kind of the, the main actions that are happening, and then the the uh, propositions are the the prepositions are seen as ma minor processes, which allow extra uh, participants to be brought in. Now, in some languages, there's a very strict distinction between these the direct. Well, these are called direct participants, and these would be called indirect participants. So there, in some languages, there's a, there's a real clear distinction between those that are obligatory or direct or core, and then those that are you know, uh, non-obligatory or indirect or oblique. There's lots of names for them, but many languages make a clear distinction between them. English does make a distinction in a clause like this, but then once it's in there, we, if you pacify, we allow uh, these guys to be pacified. So the cup, you could say the cup is what the water evaporated out of. Um, so in English, we're kind of loosening these constrictions on, on how we use these indirect ones. They can become subject, but that's a recent change in English. In Old English, you couldn't do that. Um, <clears throat> but the, so if you think about Chinese, it's a very instructive to think about Chinese. Those of you who know some Chinese, all of the prepositions in Chinese come from verbs. So if you say, uh, he at their eating, or I uh, if I take this and throw, arrive over there, uh, <laughs> sounds great. Uh, so the, you know, the, the to is actually means to arrive, you know, and the, the at it actually is the existential verb to be at a place. So you can see how very clearly these are extra verbs that were added to the sentence to allow you to bring in extra participants. So in Chinese, they're actually still full processes in many cases. Uh, but in, in English, these things are all just, we call them minor processes because 
They don't stand by themselves, but they allow you to bring in these extra participants uh, with these preposition phrases. <clears throat> so if you say the water evaporated from the cup or the water seeped into the room, uh, the man made a boat out of the tree. So all of these things, when you want to bring in the tree, you want to bring in the cup, you want to bring in whatever, uh, you do it using the preposition because it's not part of the core process uh, of, uh, in the way, at least the way you profiled it there. You can profile it differently and then make that a, a direct participant. Why am I coming over here? I should be over here. Um, okay, any more questions about material processes? <coughs> Okay, the next type we're going to talk about is mental processes. Now, <clears throat> with a mental process, it's basically the state of your mind. What's going on in this coconut here? Um, so this is not something you can see. This is not something that you uh, can be aware of with other people. And some languages make a clear distinction about what's going on in your mind and what's going on in other people's minds. In other words, like in Japanese and, and many other languages, you cannot talk about what's going on in someone else's mind because you, you don't know what's going on in other people's mind. You have no authority to talk about. So you, like in English, I can say, oh, he likes, he likes to drink beer or he wants to drink beer, right? In Japanese, you can't say he likes to drink beer. You can say, I like to drink beer, you know, biro nomitai, I want to drink beer. Uh, but I cannot say he biro nomitai because I don't have the, that means he wants to drink beer, because I don't have what's called the epistemic authority. I don't have the right to talk about what's going on inside his head, because I don't know what's going on inside his head. He can tell me if he wants. He can say, oh, biro no uh, But uh, if he doesn't tell me that, then I have no idea what's going on in his head. And so I have no right to say what's going on in his head. And many languages make a strict distinction between these things. So there's lots of states of my mind now, what I am seeing, what I'm hearing, what I'm thinking, right? And it's good you don't see what's going on in there. Um, no, and vice versa. Uh, so you've got all kinds of things going on in your heads and uh, other people can't see it until you try to express it. Now, um, so these are not a doing, these are states of mind. And in many languages, they will be talked about as stative verbs because they just talk about states. Um, and so these are things like the, the, the processes of consciousness, like perception, you know, whether seeing or hearing, or desiderative just means like wanting or, or uh, intending to do something. Emotive is liking, fearing, hating, and all the other kinds of emotions. These are all things that just happen inside your head. And cognitive, like to think something, to know something, to understand something, right? If you think about, oh, he knows French, what does it mean to know French? It's not an active thing. It just means that there is this knowledge inside his head. There's a state of knowledge. Um, and so because it is just a, a state of kind of thing, when we talk about it, um, we use generally a simple present tense because it's just a state. So you say, I know it. I don't say I'm knowing it. If you hear some Indian English, they'll say, I'm knowing it. Uh, are you, is there anyone you are knowing that could vouch for you? Uh, something like that. Uh, but that's Indian English, and that's different from uh, like American and British English. Normally, we don't use the present progressive with states. We only use the simple present. Um, so like, I know it. I think, I think he's great. I know that he's great. Um, I see you sitting there. I hear you moving. These are all simple present, right? Um, I mean, there are, there are again cases, again, these are, everything I say here is like you, is just the general situation, the unmarked. So I can say, you know, like in McDonald's says, I'm loving it, right? Now that really is bizarre. It's weird English because normally you say, I love it, right? You don't say, you know, uh, I'm loving it. it. But the reason why they did that again you make the choice to do things in a different way because you want to make it special, you want to make it different from the usual. If you just say, I love it, it doesn't give the same sense of agency. When you say, I'm loving it, it makes it more like it's a material process. So I'm really actively enjoying this or really actively doing something, right? So you can see how 
using the, the tense that's normally used with material processes on a material, on a mental verb like, uh, or a mental process like love. Love is normally would you say, I love it. When you use the, um, the, mater the, the normal tense used for material process on the mental one, it changes how you interpret that. So this is how you can play with language. Uh, you have these choices and then you're going to get a different outcome. So I'm loving it means something different from I love it. And they did that on purpose. They choose it that way. And so people remember it because it is unusual. Then they'll remember that slogan, you know. Um, so with, the, with this, again, with, with, as I mentioned, each process has different types of participants. So since there's no doing, there's no happening, it's just a state, then we don't talk about an actor because an actor is someone who acts or does something. In this case, it's just a sensor. All you're doing is sensing something. When I hear the noise and I hear the, the air conditioner or I hear something, I'm just sensing something, right? So that's why we call it, a, I'm a sensor. Uh, so instead of calling the person who does it, when I say I hear the air conditioner, I there is the sensor and the air conditioner my sensing the air conditioner doesn't, the air conditioner doesn't care at all about me sensing it. Um, it. I'm not affecting the air conditioner at all by my sensing it. So it's not a goal. My sensing doesn't get carried over to the air conditioner in the same way that my throwing this thing carries over to this thing. Um, so we call that just a phenomenon. It's just, in some theories, they call it a stimulus because it, it's a stimulus for making me sense something, to admit for you know, causing this state of my mind is the stimulus. So in this case, the noise of the, uh, the air conditioner is a stimulus that's causing me to become aware of it and causing this state of my mind. And so the, in this theory though, we call it phenomenon rather than stimulus, but it's the same idea. Now the sensor is generally human or it can be human-like. You know, what, this is an interesting thing about these structures, just like with the McDonald's example. When you use a kind of unusual um, type of sensor, when you, when you stick another word, like Halliday gives the example of the house was longing for their return, right? So when you put the house in there, even though a house is not normally sentient, you know, it doesn't have feelings, but when you use it in that construction, all of a sudden it takes on human-like qualities. So this is, this is what happens when you, you, know, you have this kind of general pattern for talking about mental uh, processes. And when you use even an, an in, inanimate object in that sensor position, it takes on the qualities of a human. So this is another way that we play with language. Um, we, the, the meaning comes from the construction that you use the words in. So the house there is not used in the normal sense of just some kind of inanimate object. It's used more as, um, you know, in the, in the place of a sensor. So it takes on this human-like quality. Um, and the, one of the interesting things about the mental processes is, is you can have the sensor as subject, like an I hear the, uh, the, the air conditioner or I like to eat uh, peanut butter, um, you can also, uh, so I like this, uh, and you can have passives of the please type. So um, uh, I was pleased by his, um, his coming to class on time every day. Um, but you can also have the phenomenon as subject when you say, you know, his coming to class every day pleased me or uh, the passives of the like type. So um, instead of saying, I, I like to eat that, I could say peanut butter. Um, no, that doesn't look good. But let me show you. So like he doesn't like flowers. So this is the, pa the active. He doesn't like flowers where you have the sensor as subject. He hates linguistics. You wouldn't all think this way, right? Um, I see the flowers. She heard the noise. She thinks cows are dumb. They understand what I mean. I want a new bike. They would like flowers in their room. So you see, it's all simple present tense. And the sensor is generally human. And then the phenomenon can be anything, it, it, whatever it is. It doesn't, there's no restriction on the phenomenon. Uh, these are all objects, but it, we'll talk in a minute about other types that aren't even objects. Now in the other type, you can say the noise bothers me. So this is where the phenomenon is subject. 
Um, so dogs frightened me. The noise assailed my ears. His remarks struck me as odd. That scene puzzled him. The stake tempted me. So in each of these cases, you have the, the phenomenon as subject. And these are paired, and each one of them has the passive possibility as well. I was tempted by the stake. So you have four choices there. Um, in, in these cases, so you have the, the, in the active, you have a choice of phenomenon as subject. This is how you profile. I'm talking about your choice in profiling the event. So you have these four choices. One is using the, um, the sensor as subject in the, in the unmarked case, or using the phenomenon as subject in the unmarked case, or using the passive of either of those. And so each one, each of these four choices is going to have a different effect when you use it. And so you can play with those. It gives you, in terms of expressing these mental processes, these mental events, you have these choices, these four different choices. Um, now, as I mentioned in the examples I just gave you, these were all objects. But in many times when we talk about the phenomenon that we're, that's affecting us, it's either an action that somebody took, what we call an act, or it's a fact, it's some kind of proposition that we accept uh, as a fact, or some, you know, uh, something like a fact. So in terms of the act, it's a representation of some kind of happening or event, uh, like the man walking out the door. So if I say I noticed him walking across the lawn, or I noticed him walking out the door, so again, it's just a mental, I have a mental representation of this act in my head. So that's what it means to say I noticed him walking out the door. It means there's a mental representation of him walking out the door. So this act here, the phenomenon, is what is affecting my brain, right? So again, this is not affected by me sensing it, but um, I am affected by this. And uh, in some cases, in some theories, they call this experiencer because you're experiencing this mental event. Uh, so we call it sensor in this theory, but you can also think of it in many other theories, they'll call it experiencer because you're experiencing this mental event. Um, she felt the butter melting in her hand. Uh, so here, the butter melting in her hand is just some thing that happened in the real world, an act that happened in the real world. But by me seeing it, that creates a representation in my mind that becomes a mental event for me. So then I have this representation of it. Or you saw him drag the body out of the shed, didn't you? So very often, you know, and it, yeah, this is a weird example, but anyway. Um, you know, so you might see this on a CSI kind of show uh, where they're interrogating somebody. And so they'll use a clause like this. Um, yeah, we actually had a discussion many years ago in linguistics that we should stop using sexist examples and violent examples. We used to always say, John killed Mary or something like that. And, and we got to stop using those kind of examples. And then it became John kissed Mary. And it's like, well, it's still not great. You know? So anyway, um, better to use natural examples. And then a fact is just something you kind of take for granted as being a fact or being uh, a possibility or an idea. In these examples, so you say, I regret that I never, oops, oops, sorry about that. I regret that I never learned to speak Italian, or you can put the fact that I never learned to speak Italian. So that just shows that you're ex accepting it as a fact. But this is just means it's just some proposition, you know, some idea, uh, and you can even call it an idea. You could say, I dislike the idea that she was a lady, or she disliked the idea that she was a lady and so should, should, should act like one. So here you're actually tagging it as an idea, or in the last one, you are ignoring the possibility that he might have done it. So you're taking it as a possibility. Um, and then the possibility is what? That he might have done it. So this proposition um, is what is, if, is in your, you have a representation of this proposition, this act, uh, this fact in your, in your head. And that's what you're sensing. Okay, um, is that clear? It, and so these are, uh, states of mind, uh, things that are going on in your head and uh, not really going on, they're states, they're situations uh, in your head, uh, representations of, of things or representations of uh, facts or acts that are in your head at a particular time and then you're expressing them as such. 
Uh, and there are different ways you can talk about things and you have these choices as always. Any questions about mental before we move on? Okay, before we move on to relational, because that's a big uh, topic, I want, there's a couple more questions I wanted to answer. A very good question came up was, um, if I were to replace the exclamation mark uh, in a statement, uh, it, it does the, if, if you replace that with a question mark, does that, uh, in the change of intonation, does it mean it's not a declarative anymore? So in other words, if I say, he's coming today with a intonation like a statement, or I say he's coming today as a question, right? So there the grammatical form, the mood, the grammatical mood of the clause is the same. But we mark it as a clause, as a, as a question using intonation. Not all languages do this, but um, in English we can do that. We can take a declarative and mark it as a question uh, by just changing the intonation. Now, it, grammatically, it's still a, um, a declarative, but again, it's just like what I talked about before, where you can use it, an interrogative to make give an order, uh, or you can use a declarative to give an order. You can also use a declarative to ask a question. So it's just one of these kind of grammatical metaphor type things where you're using a, a form that grammaticalized for one function to do something else. And that's a common thing that we will find in language in many ways. Uh, and the same thing was like, are rhetorical questions classified as questions or statements? Grammatically, if it's, a, if it's you, know, uh, you know, who understands Plato? Uh, if you ask a rhetorical question like that, uh, or who understands Chomsky? Uh, they, you might hear negative things about Chomsky from me now and then. Um, so the, uh, uh, you know, if you ask a rhetorical question like that, grammatically it's still a question, but it's just the hearer has to understand that you're using it in the non, the unmarked, you're using it in a marked way, not in the unmarked way. So the unmarked way would be it's a real question. And sometimes people do get confused. You know, they'll answer a rhetorical question. Um, this happens because it is um, it, not ambiguous. I don't like to use the word ambiguous. It's just uh, all forms of language are ambiguous and to a certain extent because it's never deterministic. It's never guaranteed that what you say is what you intend people to understand, they're actually going to understand. In fact, most of the time they don't get what you're really under, trying to get across. So language is very indeterminate in that sense. Uh, when we speak, uh, it's all up to it's a very risky thing actually trying to communicate. And uh, so you're taking a big risk that you, the other person's going to be able to guess what it is you're trying to say. And especially when you use these kind of more marked forms like using a question when you're really making a statement or using a statement when you're asking a question and whatever, the people may not understand it. Not as easily as if you'd use the unmarked form. So again, it's choices you make. You want that rhetorical effect and you hope the other person will get it, like with irony. So irony is the same thing. You actually say the opposite of what you meant, but you hope the person understands that you actually mean the opposite because if they actually understood it as you said it, then you might be in trouble. Uh, so you, you, know, you really have to be careful in communicating. And communicating is not guaranteed. A lot of people think, oh, I said that, so he should have understood that. But no, that's not the way it works. Uh, most of the time, it takes a lot of work to really get clarity in terms of communication. You have to work at it. Um, another question was, in the theme ream structure, is there a hierarchy? Um, the textual must come before the interpersonal and then the topical. And what if there are words with two functions, as in what, as in then what did Sally buy with the money? So when you have a word like what, which has a double function there, um, as marking kind of interrogative and also it's a theme, uh, then it's not a problem. Uh, and then the then there is a, um, a, a textual continuative. So, um, so that's not a problem there. It's still coming before the in, uh, interpersonal and topical. And it's again, all of these things, there's just the usual pattern, but it doesn't mean you won't find exceptions. There's always exceptions because you know, as Sapir, a famous linguist, once said, all grammars leak. This is one of the problems with so-called formal grammar, is formal grammar assumes that everything is a very nice, neat, exceptionless system. 
but all grammars leak means there's nothing that's exceptionless. There's always going to be exceptions. Whatever rule you write, there's going to be exceptions to it. So, you know, that's why I don't write rules, really. I just say, well, it's, it's like, the, you know, a lot of times formalists, you know, in, in linguistics, there's two big camps. There's the formalists and the functionalists. And the formalists explain form with form, and the functionalists explain form with function. And they will, they, they're trying to be very rigorous and very, you know, for creating these very, this, the function, formalists are trying to create these very rigid systems. And they will say that we're being unrigorous because we will say, well, this rule holds 90% of the time, rather than saying it's 100% of the time, because they want rules. Like when I wrote my grammar, I wrote a, a grammar of the Qiang language. If you know, in Northern Sichuan, if you, if you remember in 2008, there was a big earthquake. Uh, that was an area where there's people called the Chang live. And uh, years before, in the 1990s, I, I went up into the mountains and I documented their language. It's one of the things linguists do, is you go and you document undocumented languages. So I documented this language called Chang, and I wrote a grammar, and I published it. And then a famous formalist linguist named uh, Anderson um, criticized, he wrote a review of my grammar, and he criticized it because I said, well, generally it's like this, and generally it's like that, and most of the time it's like this. And he was very upset that I was not giving these very cut and dried, oh, it is like this, it is not like this. And it's like, language isn't like that. Language is human behavior. How much of our behavior is 100% consistent? None, zero, absolutely nada. You know, this, it just isn't consistent. So all grammars leak. Uh, people who really understand language will understand that, that it's, it's, there's always going to be exceptions to anything. So don't get tied up thinking that every rule has to be 100%, because it's not. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so now let's get on to any questions about that or anything else. Now, the last type of the major, I said there were three major processes and three minor processes. The, the last major process type is called relational. And what this means is you're just relating two participants. And that's very simple. It sounds very simple, but it's actually one of the most complicated parts of the grammar. Uh, so you have different ways of relating dip, the two participants. And it's this very interesting part of uh, how we represent things. And in some, uh, you know, we have different genre of um, language. Uh, you know, when we create a text, we do it in different ways, which we call genre. So if I'm chatting with somebody in conversation, that's one genre. If I'm telling a story, that's another genre. If I'm telling you how to build a boat, that's another genre we call procedural text. Um, then there's also a difference between spoken language and written language. Halliday has actually written a lot about, Michael Halliday has written a lot about the difference between spoken language and written language, because they're quite different. Um, and one of the differences is that spoken language has a lot more of these material and mental processes in it, whereas written language has a lot more relational processes in it, that very often you will have these, and a lot more uh, what we call grammatical metaphor in the written language. Well, if we have time, we'll get into that later. Um, so with the relational processes, the, the idea is that you have, uh, you're describing some kind of relationship. So you're either char characterizing something as something else, or you are saying one thing is equal to something else. Could you put that away? Um, so for example, if I say she is a poet, or she is beautiful, right? I'm characterizing her in some way. If I say, I am the teacher, uh, then I'm identifying me as the person who is the one teaching. Um, or, um, so in these cases, you're relating one fragment of experience with another, and the participants that we talk about here, one of the participants we're gonna be talking about is identified uh, in the equational clauses. So if I say, I am the teacher, then I am identified and I'm, I'm going to give me, I'm going to identify, identify myself in some way. So I say, I am the teacher. So the teacher is the identifier. Yes, how do, how do I, how am I identified? Uh, and then if it's uh, of the classifying type, we call the person who is being classified the carrier of the attribute. So the, if I say she is beautiful, then she is the carrier and beautiful is the attribute, right? So uh, that's pretty straightforward. 
And in this case, is, again, there is no doing going on here. These are, these are also a kind of state of being, right? So she is beautiful. It's a state of being beautiful, or I am the teacher. It's a state of being the teacher. I'm not doing anything by being the teacher. I'm just, that's my situation. So these, again, the unmarked tense is the simple present. So I wouldn't say, I am being the teacher, right? Um, I could if I wanted to, but it, it, you know, people think, why did he say it like that? Uh, so that's sometimes what happens when you say things in the unmarked way, uh, in the marked way, it's people just don't know why you did that. Because actually the, the ultimate thing, the, the bottom line of all communication is people guessing why you did what you did, right? Whether it's linguistic or non-linguistic, what they're trying to do is figure out why did he say that or why did he do that? Or in most con 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 situations, you're actually doing two things together. You're doing speech and using your hands and face and everything else, your eyebrows. Uh, you, um, you use all of these. In the Philippines, you actually say yes like that. Say, did you go to the store? Yeah. Uh, and you can also say hello that way. It's a sneaky way of saying hello. Uh, so, um, so with the relational processes, we have three subtypes. Uh, one, is, the most common one is the uh, intensive type when you just say, you know, X is A or, you know, she is beautiful or I am the teacher. So um, that's just straightforward. But there's also circumstantial and possessive types. Now the circumstantial type is just talking about, again, the meaning. Again, we're, we're, we're talking about the meaning of the forms here. So it has a circumstantial meaning, and that meaning is either expressed in the process itself or it's process is expressed in the type of participant, the attribute. Uh, so when, uh, I'll give you more examples in a minute. But um, so the relationship is between, uh, you know, it involves some kind of time, place, manner, cause, accompaniment, role, matter, or angle. So these are all types of, of circumstances. So if the meaning involves one of these circumstantial kinds of meanings, then we call that a circumstantial relational process. If the meaning involved is one of possession, like he has a piano, or that blue car is mine, then, then we say that it's a possessive process, a relational process. And each of these can be talked about in these two ways that I mentioned earlier. I said classifying and identifying but we normally talk about the classifying type as attributive because it's an attribute. You're giving it an attribute like she is beautiful. You're saying that she has this attribute of being beautiful. So if I say, you know, beauty is an attribute of her or identifying, you know, I am the teacher. So the teacher is the identity of me. Um, so each of these uh, has these two types. So if we put this together, into a table, you can see the three types, the intensive, circumstantial, and possessive, and each has attributive and identifying type. So uh, Sarah is wise is an attributive type where we're, we're giving Sarah the attribute of being wise. And in this case, it's kind of like saying Sarah is a member of the class of wise people. Um, so when you're doing that, the attribute is going to be usually an indefinite noun or it's going to be an adjective. So like Sarah is wise, Sarah is a poet, Sarah is a teacher, um, uh, whereas when, uh, or he sounds like a blockhead. In the identifying type of clauses, it's, um, is a fish in the other end. Um, this, uh, Tom is the leader. Uh, when you, with the identifying, one of the aspects is that they're reversible. Because it's an equational clause, it's just like one and one equals two. You can say two equals one and one. So when it's kind of like an equal sign. Whereas with the others, these are not reversible. You didn't say wise is Sarah, unless you're Yoda. Um, so uh, why, why is, uh, Sarah is wise is the only way we would normally say that. It's not reversible like these are. So you could say Tom is the leader or the leader is Tom. Those are both, but again, they are choices you make. And there's actually four choices you can make in terms of um, how you represent these. And again, the meaning will be different depending on the choice you make. It will depend on the context. So when we say the leader is Tom, then we're saying Tom is identified as the one who is the leader. 
or being the leader serves to identify Tom. Um, and where I say, I am the teacher or the teacher is me. Now, you, again, you notice here that these are not passive in the sense that the teacher is me. Um, the, here, it's, it, it doesn't take the, the subject form of the pronoun. This one, it takes the subject form. This is the non-subject form of the pronoun. So this one is not uh, actually passive in a formal sense. But it would have different meaning depending on the context that you use it in. Now, with the circumstantial meaning, you would say something like tutorial is every Thursday, right? Um, uh, or the fair is on a Tuesday. So in this case, it's not a, a, uh, an equational type of meaning. It's a characterization or an attributive type of meaning. Um, well, what about the tutorials? Well, they're every Thursday. Whereas if you say today is Halloween, Halloween is today. Uh, tomorrow is the 10th, the 10th is tomorrow. So again, it's reversible, but in this case, because it's dealing with time, which is one of the circumstantial meanings, then we consider this a circumstantial relational process. Uh, or possessive, uh, I own a Rolls Royce, yeah. Um, Peter has a piano, uh, the car is mine, mine is the car. So again, these are reversible. The car is mine, mine is the car. The piano is Peter's, Peter's is the piano. Uh, so. Um, again, it's the same thing when you say Peter has a piano, it's just like saying Peter is beautiful, but in this case, the meaning involved is not just simply having an attribute, but owning something. Now, in these, in, in, to go into more detail about the attributive type, intensive attributive type, the, um, these express the idea that the carrier, the one that's usually the subject, uh, has a particular attribute that is belongs to a particular class of entities. So the attribute is when we say something like beauty, beautiful, or a poet, or a teacher, then we're saying something like the class of beautiful things, or the class of people who are poets, or the class of uh, people who are teachers. Um, and so that's why if it's the, a noun group like a teacher, it's going to be indefinite. It can't be a proper noun or a pronoun. So you can't say, uh, you know, you can't use I, me, him, it, or something. Uh, it's going to be like a poet, a teacher, you know, indefinite with the a in front of it. The order of the participants is not reversible and there's no passive form. The probe for these clauses is what, how, or what is it like? So you say, what is she like? Oh, she's beautiful. Um, or she has a nice personality. Um, these, uh, these are going to be uh, uh, answering the question of, you know, what is it like? Well, it's, it's long, or it's short, or it's fat, or whatever. Uh, or how is it? Well, it's quite long. Um, the process is going to be one of the ascriptive type, so the, the, by here we mean like the kind of verb used is going to be something like become, so she became a great beauty, uh, it, she seems like a nice person. Uh, she appears to be a nice person. Uh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, that smells delicious. Um, that is wonderful or that feels good, right? So these are all using these different kinds of, ascriptive just means you're ascribing some quality to the carrier. You're saying something about the carrier. And the attribute can be any kind of entity that you want, to, any kind of, you know, talking about it as a, as a class, like a poet or a, a tragedy, that, oh, that's a real tragedy, um, or a quality like small or sad, and it can be the material, uh, like small or a poet or mental, you could say, oh, that's sad, or um, she was afraid, or she's worried, uh, and it can be including adjectival forms of mental verbs. Because these, you know, worrying, dreadful, puzzling, frightening, these are again representing states of mind. So they can be used also as these um, attributes. So that is worrying, you know, or you could say that is frightful, um, uh, or that is puzzling, you know. So here's some examples. He seems to be quite good. The old village became a big city in a short time. So these can take circumstances. Um, and the, the two main uh, 
participants or carry an attribute in the process is these types. Uh, the children stayed quiet in class. You look great. Those students are wonderful writers. John is a terrible singer. The witch turned into a beautiful girl. Sarah is wise. Today's weather is going to be warm and sunny. The minister didn't seem sure of himself. Your story sounds like complete nonsense. Mice are timid creatures. So these are pretty straightforward, just saying something about the carrier. And if we, if we block it like this, where we put everything together, the mood, the theme, and ream, um, as you're going to be doing in the tutorials, then, you know, and this is also exactly what the test is going to be about when we get to the test. Um, the, it, there's no surprises. All we're doing in this entire semester is just analyzing the text, finding the constituents, and then giving them functional labels. That's all you will be doing um, throughout the whole thing. So it's just about learning, you know, how to draw the constituents and then how to give the labels. That's all you're really going to be doing. But, and it seems very simple, it's straightforward, but it's actually very rich and useful system for understanding what's going on in text. So in this case, you know, he is a blockhead. Um, you've got he as a subject and the carrier, the mood. Uh, in this case, the is is both the finite and the predicator. And then the blockhead, the attribute is a complement, uh, which appears then in the residue. And then your theme is the subject and carrier, and the rest is the ream. So pretty straightforward, um, at least in the unmarked case. In the marked case, maybe a little bit different. Okay, so that's the uh, attributive, intensive attributive clauses. Now the intensive identifying clauses is, intensive here is, I don't know why he uses that word actually, it just means the kind of the usual non-circumstantial, non-possessive. So it just means everything but non-circumstantial and possessive. So that's what we mean when we say intensive. Um, so the, the identifying clauses are different from the other ones because they express the idea of one entity being the same as another in some way. So you've got two things you're equating. Um, and one is called the identifier, and that identifies the identified. So one is the identifier, one is the identified. And these things are kind of fluid as to what, it depends on the context, which is the identifier and which is the identified. They normally have a definite nom nominal group and a superlative adjective. So if you say, I am the teacher, or I am the tallest person in this room, so then you, the the there narrows it down to a single individual. So it's not a group. It's not like a teacher where you're just one of the group of teachers when you say, I am the teacher, you're narrowing it down to one individual. And you're saying, I is one individual, the teacher is one individual, and I'm equating those two. So it's different from the other one where you've got the whole group, uh, where the a uh represents like all the poets or all the teachers. In this one, you're using, or the superlative adjective, also when you say the best one, he's the best student in the class, or he's the tallest in the class, or she's the prettiest in the class, that the, again, is narrowing it down to one, the, you know, when you use the superlative. And these have an equative process where you're saying like he plays, uh, like he plays the villain in the play, or he acts as the villain in the play, or this means, you know, CAT means cat, or this reflects uh, what we talked about earlier, or this equals that, or this includes that, or this represents that. Um, and these, they're reversible. So you say, I'm the teacher, the teacher is me. And in this case, the, the probe for this, the question you would ask is, who is? So who is the teacher? Or who is the tallest in the class? Or who is the prettiest in the class, right? So that's very different from what is they like. You know, so the attributive is, what is it like? And this one is, is who is? Or which is? Which is the biggest? Um, so if we look at some examples, like Bob is the one on the left. Uh, now in these ones, these examples, I've put these in bold because that's where I'm saying that the stress is. As I mentioned, we have new information, old information, and normally the unmarked case is the new information comes at the end of the clause in English. So that's where the stress goes. So we say, Bob is the one on the left, or the old village is where I grew up, or the book represents my life's work. So the stress, the prosodic, you know, the intonation 
puts the stress at the end of the clause. It doesn't have to be that way, but this is the, the most unmarked situation. So uh, Bob is the one on the left in the photo. The old village is where I grew up. That book represents my life's work. Uh, B-O-O-K spells book. Jim plays the, village in the, the villain in the play. Tom is the leader. The leader is Tom. Today's meeting represents the last chance for a compromise. C-A-T spells cat. The deadliest spiders are the funnel webs. The one in the back row of the picture must be you. So in this type, you can use pronouns and you can use um, proper nouns, uh, like Tom or you. Uh, whereas in the other type, if you use it in the other type, this is an interesting thing. Um, if you use it in the other type, again, just like with you know, the house is longing for them, if you use a proper name in the attributive type, then it will not mean the person, but it will mean something like the person. So if you say, that's a very Woody Allen movie, um, I don't know if you know Woody Allen's movies, but Woody Allen makes a particular kind of movie. So you could say, oh, this movie is very Woody Allen. So I can use Woody Allen as an attribute, um, especially if I put very in front of it, then it shows it's very clearly being used as an attribute rather than talking about Woody Allen himself. So again, it's not the words that have the meaning, it's how you use them. And so even a proper name, uh, somebody's name like Woody Allen or, uh, um, you know, uh, who's another act, uh, director or whatever, um, like uh, Picasso, you could say that's a very Picasso, you know, kind of picture. Um, so you, you just, you, you can use a person's name as an attribute. Uh, just by putting it in that construction, it will take on that meaning. Um, and it's also, I, in these, I meant these, these ones, I had the identifier in second position, and this is the normal situation, the unmarked situation, where the identifier is the kind of new information. That's the, so you know, we're talking about Bob, and what about Bob? Well, I want to identify him as the one on the left in the photo. So that's the one on the left in the photo is the identifier, but it's also possible to have the identifier uh, in subject position. Now, in that case, though, then you have to put the stress there. So rather than saying Tom is the leader, you have to say the leader is Tom, right? The leader is Tom, not Tom is the leader. So this actually is very important in English, where you put your stress. Um, and so the new information gets the stress, and you can put the new information at the, in the initial position or in the final position. And again, it's a choice you make. Um, and when you're profiling, uh, you know, when you're trying to say what you want to say, you have a choice as to which one of these, whether you put the new information at the beginning of the clause or at the end of the clause. And so there's four possibilities. And again, it's just like with the other one where I mentioned there are four possibilities with the mental processes. With these relational in identifying clauses, you have four possibilities. And so you choose in a particular context which one is going to most likely represent the meaning that you, or get the person to understand why, what you're trying to say. So if the question is, which is me, or who is the leader, then the answer could be Tom is the leader, where the, the new information comes first. Uh, and in this case, the, we haven't talked about token and value yet, but, so we, we'll come back to that. But uh, in this case, you have the new information in first position, or you, since you've asked about the leader, Normally, that will become the theme, and you say the leader is played by Tom, uh, and then the, the new information at the end. So this is the most unmarked way to answer this question, um, and this is a more marked way, which you, you might do in certain contexts where you think Tom is more topical or something. Um, but if you're asking who is Tom, uh, then you could answer Tom plays the leader or the leader is played by Tom. And in this case, you can see if we change the verb to play instead of be, be doesn't have a passive form. You can't say he is being something, uh, but you can say he is playing something. So like he is playing, uh, the, the leader is played by Tom. So here you can see that having an identifier, uh, which is also in this case the value, um, I guess I have to talk about value and token. All right, in this, in this one, 
the reason why there's four different ones is because the token is the more concrete, less abstract thing you're talking about, and the value is the more abstract thing you're talking about. So in this case, the person you're talking about, Tom, is the more concrete thing, and being a leader is the value, is the more abstract thing uh, that you're talking about. So um, the normal situation or the most unmarked situation is to have the token as subject. Um, and so in this case, when you have the identified and the token as subject, this is the most unmarked one. Uh, and the identifier and value as, uh, we'll come back to token and value if you didn't catch that. Um, that's the most unmarked situation is, is this one, where you have the identifier and value as the, uh, as the um, identifier and value in, in, at the end of the clause. Uh, and this is the, the most marked one where you have the value and identifier in initial position. So there are four choices. And it, the, again, it's not like any one of them is wrong. It's just that the particular context in which it's going to be easy for the person to understand what you're saying is going to be different. So if your question is, who is Tom, then the most easiest way for people to understand is just to say, well, Tom is the leader. And so you start with the old information and you move to the new information and it allows the person to absorb it. If you start with the new information, they might get it, but it's not as easy to process. But it depends again on the context. Um, Okay, I'm not gonna talk about token and value. We will get on to token and value, but there's no time for it now. Uh, we'll have to continue this next time. Any quick questions before we end for today? Okay, that's all then.